My name is Timuel D. Black, Jr. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, December 7th, 1918. My father had, my mother had been sharecroppers and they were the children of former slaves who had been, emanci who had been uh, emancipated after the Civil War. Now, uh, during the Civil War, my grandfather on my father's side was both on both sides. He had to be by a slave master on the, on the Confederate side. But as soon as he had an opportunity, he went to the, uh, to the Union side and uh, he received uh, commendations for being a good soldier. So my father and mother met in Birmingham and my brother and my sister and I were born in Birmingham, Alabama. My mother was from Florence, Alabama, which was the home of the first black congressman to be elected in the North after Reconstruction. His name was Oscar de Priest. Also in that, in that town of Florence, Alabama, where a museum is erected to his honor, was the founder of blues music, W.C. Handy. So when we moved to Chicago, Right after the race ride of 1919, we moved in August, the race ride was induced in July. We moved to the south side of Chicago and we moved into the neighborhood which is known as the Grand Boulevard neighborhood, 48th and St. Lawrence. And so the Grand Boulevard that I'm referring to was one of the most prominent boulevards in the world at that time, which ranked with the Champs-Élysées in France and Paris. And while I was still young, when I was in fourth grade grammar school at Edmund Burke School, I saw Charles A. Lindbergh walk down Grand Boulevard, all the famous, and the Crown Prince Wilhelm, who was the grandson of the, of the uh, Kaiser, in uh, Germany, so many parades, and then the Bud Billiken Parade, which came uh, later in 1939 or 30, 1939. I was in a visitor in all of that. My life in Chicago on the South Side was very, very interesting because at that time, because of housing segregation, we lived in a a ghetto which Robert Abbott, the founder and, and for the publisher of the Chicago Defender called the Black Belt. And it was called the Black Belt because we were literally hemmed in on all four sides. On the north end of the Black Belt, which was about 24th Street on the north, we dared not go north of that the neighborhood unless we expect some trouble. The south end was 67th Street on the south uh, towards a neighborhood called Woodlawn. And likewise, going south of that 67th would put you in some kind of harm's way unless you were working. On the west side of uh, that black belt, we could go as far as the Rock Island Railroad track and if we went west of the Rock Island Railroad track, we had to be prepared to fight because that part was populated by newly arrived immigrants or their children, Polish, uh, Italian, uh, Ukrainian, and others like that on, the, on that west of, but we would go there to play softball and basketball, but if we won, we had to be prepared to start running right away because there would be on the east side of the Black Belt that we could go as far east as the east side, the west side of Cottage Grove. But in that Black Belt, during that period from roughly 1919 to World War II, we created what we call parallel institutions, parallel economic institutions, parallel political institutions, parallel cultural institutions, 
parallel social institutions. And so it was just the population overcrowdedness. An example would be that in the adjoining white communities, the population density was something like 21,000 per square mile. In the Black Belt, it was 84,000 per square mile. Same amount of space, four times as many people. However, since most of us came from the, rural, from the urban South, rather than the rural, we knew one another pretty well and we knew something about living in the city. My parents came from Birmingham. Many of their friends, had, had my, my grandmother on my mother's side was already here, who had already, who had been a former slave. My uncles and aunts were here or in Detroit. So most of the people who came in that period of time were similar to my family. We knew one another. We had friends and relatives who were already here who helped us learn how to live in a big city. Say us, because at the time I was still a baby. And uh, we moved into the south side first, the neighborhood where we moved in <clears throat> after the race riot uh, had been dominantly upper uh, middle class Irish Catholic Jewish. Those folks left the old neighborhood after the riot. And that's left space for those of us who were just coming. But again, talking about economic uh, things. There were many businesses in the black community, but the biggest one was the numbers policy, it was called. And it, it, it had a gross of over a hundred million dollars a year, but it was nickel and dime, and so the gangsters, those are illegal, the gangsters didn't know how much money until after World War II. And then later, of course, when the, when the state and the city found out, they transferred it with the recommendation of a black uh, uh, state legislator uh, to make it what we now call the uh, lottery. From the illegal to the legal, <laughs> same behavior, but that was a source of income and the biggest persons were the Jones brothers whose father was a prominent minister in Vicksburg, Mississippi and they were college graduates, and they looked at this as an opportunity to make money. Out of that, they could lend, they could make loans. We had also insurance companies and funeral parlors, and no one could have business in the black community. Most of the, most of the non-Jewish fled the old black belt, but mentioned the Jewish population had small stores, and some continued to live in the neighborhood, and they had small stores, but we had to let them know that we couldn't just, we didn't just sweep the floor. We had to be able to punch the cash register. So we organized and we had a theme called don't spend your money where you can't work. And because we couldn't belong to the clerks, and then we began to punch the cash register and learn how to wait on customers, learn how to be salespeople. And then our businesses that we had, the first 10 black uh, certified public accountants in the country came out of the black belt because there were businesses, insurance business. There was a bank, the Bengal State Bank, and there was the National Bank, Douglas National Bank. And so there was hair care business and barber shops and all kinds of small businesses and along with the white businesses that who remained, it made it possible for a young guy like myself to not have to go looking for a job. It was right in the neighborhood. Don't spend your money where you can't work and learn some skills as well. And so until World War II, primarily that's what young people like myself, my father had worked in the steel mills in Birmingham outside of Selma, Alabama, not Selma, but the, uh, the uh, steel mill that right outside of Besma at Bessemer Steel in Birmingham. And he came here, <clears throat> but he couldn't join the, 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 the Steel Workers Union in the beginning, but he had to feed his family, so he walked across the picket line until he was able to join the union. In the early days of trying to have uh, jobs in the black community, 
we couldn't join the retail clerks, so we formed our own retail clerks union that was headed by St. Louis Kelly, J. Levert Kelly, who was a very aggressive guy who had started the uh, idea of don't spend your money where you can't work. And the newspapers took it up, the bee and the whip and the defender. And so those early days from World War I to World War II were days of deep congestion, but it was not unpleasant. We walked the streets at night. Even though we were poor, we were not poverty-stricken, and we had a belief that one day we were not going to be poor anymore. And we had enough identifiable prosperity with doctors and lawyers and teachers and social workers <clears throat> living nearby that we could see by example that being black did not necessarily mean you had to be poor. So that was encouraging. And so we continued, and most of us <clears throat> in my generation graduated from high school, and most went on either to go to college or to businesses and then promote their children to be sure to go to college. And most of those people in my generation, their children, not only went to college, the historical black colleges and universities, but began to go to the Harvards and the Yales and the Stanfords and so on. My son went to Stanford. My daughter went to Bennington College and then to Northwood. Our generation, but my generation generally all graduated from high school, but we did well otherwise and look forward to our children. That's description of the first great migration, roughly from 1915 to 1950. Now, maybe you have some questions you want to ask me. Okay? I can keep on talking this way. Oh, say again. I say, maybe you have some questions you oh. No, I think what, what you're doing fine. I just want to make, you know, if you could uh, uh, talk about the, uh, you know, you entered service. Were you in the service? Okay. Tell a little bit about uh, your service and uh, sure. any prejudices in service and uh, what you were, your activities in when you were in service. And, sure, uh, okay. After, after service, mm -hmm. when you... Uh, return home. Yeah, when you returned home, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about your family, uh, or whatever. How was your life when you returned home? Mm -hmm. and you, you know, okay. Uh, okay, I roll along. Bring it back up to date. Okay, I just roll, roll, I roll along. Okay, so when I was in, uh, continued, and then uh, when. They, December the 7th, 1941, we heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Now, I, we didn't have television in those days. There was only radio, and you'd be in places and you'd entertainment, either live entertainment or t entertainment by the, uh, by the jukebox. And I was in my favorite uh, hangout tavern on 63rd to 411, it was called, owned by one of the policy moguls, uh, one of the, uh, one of the, je, je, the, the brothers, or not the Jones brothers, but the, uh, another family that had control, but they used these things as fronts, the tavern. And that was not unusual. So I was in the 411 with two of my friends, Joe Bowles, and uh, the other who became a playwright. I can't remember his name. And that's, they kept saying, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. Pearl Harbor has been bombed. I turned to Joe and I said, she shouldn't have drank so much. I thought Pearl Harbor was a woman because when you talked about bombed or stoned in those days, it meant you'd been, you'd overdrank. But we soon found out that that was a police, not a woman. And the next day, the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, declared war on Germany, Italy, and Japan. And so 
it wasn't long since we had a selective service system operating that many of us began to be drafted. In the meanwhile, there was a big race ride in 1943 in New York and in Detroit. And my, we black could not get up, black young men could not get up to Detroit, even though we had relatives who were living in Detroit and may have been victims of the ride. So it made, uh, made uh, some of us very, very angry about being drafted into an army where we couldn't even protect our relatives at home. So when I was drafted, I refused to, to pledge the allegiance to the United States, but I was drafted anyhow. And though I had not wanted to necessarily be in combat, I was um, put into the quartermasters, which I selected. I had taken my Army General Classification Test and scored high enough to be a, 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 an officer, that is, a lieutenant, a captain, or something of that sort. But because the Army at that time had their quota of Negro officers, you had to go into a unit. I was in Camp Lee, Virginia, and the first time that I had really been in, a, in the South after my parents had brought me to, taken my brother and sister and myself to Chicago, well, I didn't know how you behaved in the South. I didn't know that you were supposed to sit in the back of the bus. I didn't know that you, if a white person came in to do some shopping, and you, even though you had on your soldier uniform, any white person could come in and get in front of you. I didn't know that. So it was shocking to me, and some places I resented so much that I uh, kind of I almost got myself in trouble, though my wife, my mother, had <laughs> demanded I come home with honorable discharge. My father didn't want me to go at all because I was different than my brother. I was more like my father. He was kind of aggressive. My brother could make easy adjustment. So I was going to go to see my brother in North Carolina at the camp where he was stationed as a, uh, as a uh, master sergeant doing training soldiers in engineering. My brother had already was a college graduate, University of Illinois but yet he couldn't be become a commissioned officer because of the quota system. But I was going to see him, I got on the bus, not thinking I would have gone to the back of the bus. And then a young white fella gets on the bus, I guess with his girlfriend, and immediately I knew what he was going to say when seeing me and sitting on the front of the bus. And I made an emotional decision to myself that it was time to die, to go overseas and die so he could keep me sitting on the back of the bus? No, no, no. So when the bus driver came to me to tell me that I was sitting in the wrong place, I asked him, why? And he said, because that's the law. So why didn't you tell me that when I got on? Didn't matter then. What does it matter now, I said. Then I said, do you mean to tell me I'm going overseas and put my life on the line so he can tell me where to sit on the back of the bus? No, no, no. I was very glad that very soon we'd come to the train station that I was supposed to be at to go on to North Carolina. Very soon, going back to camp, camp uh, outside of Pittsburgh, what camp uh, was that? I forget the name of it right offhand, but it was a well-known camp. Preparing all of us to go overseas, right outside of Pittsburgh. And uh, then we went to New Jersey and overseas. And up in where we were to be stationed originally in, uh, in Scotland, I believe, uh, they had many people there had never seen a black person before, and they thought we'd stayed in the sun too long. So we made friends there. And then a few days before D-Day, 
few weeks, maybe a couple of weeks, we were taken out of there and taken to Southampton, England, where we were pretty certain we would be going into battle. Though I was a quartermaster, we were assigned to combat troops for supply reasons. And then Eisenhower, who had been selected to be the, made the, the general over all the troop, all the, Af Af all the American troop in Europe, made this statement as we were losing, had been losing in North Africa, said the impossible, we do that immediately. The miraculous sometimes takes a little longer. And then a few days later, December the 6th, troops began to go into Normandy. And there were quite a number of casualties because the Germans were perched up in the mountains, firing. One of my cousins had been a combat engineer and helped to blow the seawall even before the, the Normandy invasion. Four days later, after D-Day, December, I mean, uh, the Ju June 10th, my unit, the 308th Quartermaster Railhead Unit, went in with the Third, uh, third Army, I forget which division, as supply unit, and we had to wade in with our rifles over our heads. And then down on the beaches of Normandy, uh, because some of it learned to speak a little French, we could get along pretty well with the natives who were still around. Excuse me parlez-vous francais, and so forth. And then uh, the grandson, I believe it was, of Teddy Roosevelt, who was then a general, said, we're being killed down here. Let's go inland and be killed. And so we were marshaled to go further up into France. And because uh, the supplies were coming in at that time, mostly by boat, we actually were in front of our supplies that we needed to use to supply the combat units. Well, we went on and on. They did catch up with us, and we went on into France and into um, up to northern France into. Brittany and then into uh, Belgium. And it was in Belgium that uh, we encountered the idea of the battle of the, what they call the Battle of the Bulge. And the general who had taken over the German army then recommended, not recommended, commanded that the German troops an air corps direct their firepower on supply units more than just the combat soldiers that were up in Germany. And that was quite a time because the Germans that we had doing the heavy work as prisoners let us know that we had been infiltrated, infiltrated. their units had been infiltrated with the idea of blowing up the supplies. It's funny to say that even though they were German prisoners, some of them we had made friends with and they were confidential in telling us the story that they had been infiltrated, which meant the black soldiers then had not only to take up the test because no longer could the German prisoners be assigned to, black soldiers had to take up the test of unloading and refilling the supplies as they came in. But also, we were, we were told that any white soldier that we saw, any white person we saw on the streets of that part of Liege where we were, <clears throat> we would either capture them or kill them. 
So the white troops were supposed to be safe, but they were not going to do any of the work, which some of us protested and you know, had some troubles with. Then we heard from soldiers who were returning from deeper in Germany in very horrified feelings, though all of us had been in combat, that they had seen a place up in that part of Germany called, oh, what was it camp? What did I say? When they see a part of Germany, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a camp. Uh, oh, why should I forget that? That's okay. But it was a camp, and so not believing, not quite believing that people could, in an organized Buchenwald, not believing in a, that people would organize scientifically to destroy other human beings. And my, my commanding officer and I jumped in the jeep and drove up there. We were not part of the, uh, of the units that uh, uh, freed those, the, that camp at Buchenwald. We went up there and we could smell the odors. We could, it, they were all the people who had not gone, hear the cries. We got up, we could see the bones of flesh the bones through the flesh of the people who were still remaining. And it just, for me, immediately my first feeling was kill all the Germans. Then I remember that we had Germans in the American army and that Eisenhower and Eichelberger and other come from German backgrounds. Then I began to realize and feel that this could happen to anybody, anybody. I thought back on my ancestor's slave experience of not volunteering to come to the America, but being science systematically dragged in chains, exterminated. I realized that this could happen to anyone, and I, on that spot, made a decision that when I got back home, the rest of my life was to be spent trying to make a better world. And then in August of 19... 45, I think it was August the 6th, we heard that the Americans had dropped a bomb on a city in Japan called Hiroshima, which immediately killed 100,000 people. It, I couldn't believe it again, because I had been in London during the Blake Screen when German planes had dropped 20 a thousand pound bombs and I couldn't believe it and then certainly would destroy on the next two days dropped another bomb on Nagasaki I would have preferred that's what I said to my fellow soldiers to have gone we were preparing to go to Japan to go to Japan take my chances we got ready to come back home then they turned it around the boat has been assigned to, we have been assigned to a boat. A young fellow, white fellow, with his unit, they were just coming into uh, France from the United States, had just been completed their training. They gave them the opportunity to go on that and took my unit off. And I remember standing, this young white guy says, you mean to tell me that you're going to let them take you off that boat and you've been over here all this time and I'm just getting here? What's wrong with you? I said to him, you see, you're white and I'm a Negro. And you all don't understand that. But the fact that he asked that question and made that comment was a friendly statement. And so I was very impressed as I had been, as the French and the British asked when we were, why do we see white officers over Negro troop and we never see any Negro officers over white troop? 
and I, my, I just saw that. And there were those experiences, plus my experience in growing up in Chicago, that brought me back home to spend the rest of my life trying to make this a better world. Fortunately, there are many others, black and white and brown. Not enough. When I returned to the United States, uh, I go back with my parents home where I'd been living. And an organization had been formed. <clears throat> of course, in 1941, A. Philip Randolph had started, threatened the first march on Washington. And Roosevelt was afraid to confront him on that, and so Roosevelt signed an executive order, 8802, that uh, outlawed discrimination, racial discrimination in uh, army, I mean, uh, in uh, manufacturing plants dealing with army uh, materials. So that was the first Fair Employment Act in the history, and a lot of people may not know that, 8802, 1941. And, uh, but coming back then, uh, 19, December 1945, a new movement had developed, or was in process, called the Progressive Party. The Progressive Party had many prominent names, of course, I can think of the white, black names, more easier than white, but they was all across the country. And the initial demand, because the man who had formerly been the Secretary of Agriculture and the Vice President, had been rejected uh, in place, and, and the Harris Truman had taken his place, and after Roosevelt died, Truman became the president. And so the uh, person who had been rejected, who had been Secretary of Agriculture and formerly Vice President under Roosevelt, was to be our candidate as a progressive party. And our major demand was that the army be desegregated. We would never want another segregated army. Truman was running in 1948 against uh, a, a man who had been governor, I think, of uh, New York. Uh, Oh, his name I Dewey. Dewey. Tom Dewey. Been to Tom Dewey. And Dewey was somewhat favored because the third party of the Progressive Party and the governor, the senator in South Carolina, had formed his own party. And that was dragging at that time the South was solid Democrat. And so that drained by the Progressive Party and the party in South Carolina, senator whose name I should remember, he later became governor. Uh, maybe he was governor first and then senator, but anyway, it was a well-known name. The black, one of the black leaders in the Progressive Party when we had our our uh, convention in Philadelphia, Truman said he couldn't make a difference. It would have to be up to each state. And this black lawyer got up as the principal speaker and said, let me tell you how to do it, Mr. President. Take pen in hand and sign the executive order that outlaws the segregation in the armed forces. Truman recognizing that the Progressive Party represented a substantial population, signed an executive order outlawing segregation in the armed forces. When the election was held, the day before the final announcement in the Chicago Tribune here in Chicago, the Tribune announced that Dewey had won. They had the next day that Truman had won. But he won because the Progressive Party then recommended 
that their members vote and vote for Truman, and the margin was very thin. Truman became more, he became more, uh, we might say, liberal as things moved along, and the civil rights movement, coming out of the civil liberties and civil rights era and the labor movement, began to move into, gradually into place until in Montgomery, Alabama, a young woman named Rosa Parks, along with a labor man, a public car porter by the name of E.D. Nixon, planned uh, for her to ride the bus and go to the front of the bus. She was arrested because she wouldn't move. Classical statements she made, I'm tired. And that was a statement that came used over and over again by Dr. Martin Luther King. E.D. Nixon, Ms. Parks, Ms. Parks was arrested. E.D. Nixon bailed her out, then went to look for a le leader. The bus, Montgomery bus smoke boycott starts. People like me coming out of the army began to go south to support that beginning of the civil, that beginning, Mr. Parks went to lawyer, went to the ministers to take over the leadership. Not that he could, wasn't competent. He thought he didn't have enough power and prestige. And the first, the only one that said yes was a young man who had recently arrived from the East who was born and bred in Atlanta Georgia by the name of by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. I was living in Gary at that time teaching. When I saw him on television, I thought one of the places for me to be was Montgomery, Alabama. And I immediately that weekend caught my flight and went to went to Montgomery and continued to follow Dr. King until his death, till his assassination. But in the meanwhile, locally, began to be more active in civil liberties and civil rights affairs, joined the ACLU, the, uh, the uh, Urban League, and other organizations, and, and the Chicago Committee to Defend the Bill of Rights, and many other organizations. And uh, time has taken, I've finished my, uh, received my bachelor's degree under the GI Bill of Rights from Roosevelt University and went to the University of Chicago, master's degree and had completed all but the paper in my doctorate when I saw Dr. King. And I decided being in the civil rights active movement was better than having just a PhD, though my counselor, Allison Davis, was asking me every week when I was coming back to finish that paper. Well, I never did. I never regretted that. And then, of course, the election of Harold Washington, where I was one of the initiated, well, in the Civil Rights March on Washington, uh, uh, Mr. Dr. King and Mr. Randolph asked me to organized the Chicago contingent, me and Al, not Al Ravy, but uh, Larry, L L Lawrence, K not Lawrence Kennan, I forget his name, but anyway, he's dead now. And we did, and we took a contingent of about 3,000 people from Chicago. The railroad porters provided the trains for us. On the train, I met Studs Terkel. I had known him, and he recorded uh, the voices of some of the people who were on the train, including my children. And then uh, we began to organize uh, politically. An organization called Protest at the Pl Polls. And the organization called Protest at the Polls was an organization that was developed, Lou Palmer, uh, and uh, and others who was a newspaper man at the time, and 
uh, we organized and helped to elect Jane Byrne in 1979. She disappointed us, and Lou Palmer created a, a kind of a slogan, don't spend your money, no, I mean, the slogan was, uh, we shall see in 83, and we began to build towards the idea of a black mayor in the city of Chicago. From that point on, we have been as active as we can after Harold Washington died to make the current mayor a better mayor, though he is better than his father, and uh, at the same time expanding. Now that he is not going to run anymore, and now that we have proven the idea that Eisenhower that uh, Eisenhower had said these with the impossible, we do that immediately. Well, blacks have done that throughout American history quite often, but the most dramatic example is the one that sits in the White House today by the name of uh, <laughs> President uh, Barack Obama. The struggle continues thing today that some of us are trying to do is to get more young people in the active with all the new communications, technology, the depersonalization of life has become much deeper than I would like to see it. But I believe that there are young people who know something's missing and are looking forward to the future and the dangers that are involved in, in the work area, in the education, in the health. It's a matter of getting some stimulation, which Barack Obama gave to many of those young people, not just locally and across the country, but in other places in the world. He gave them hopes. So some of us want to make him know that and feel responsible. They're hacking at him because they believe that's what he would like to see happen. So our immediate task is to protect him while engaging younger people in their own future in their local places. That's all I have to say. Can you bring me back up a little bit, just talk about uh, when you were married and your children, your personal family? Well, I was married three times. <laughs> three times. The mother of my children, she's, yeah. she's no longer living, and the, and the second wife is no longer living. But when I came out of the Army, that was one of the things, too, that most of us who were coming out had, who were not married already uh, had made decisions that we were going to marry and start family, and that's what I did. My wife was somewhat younger, uh, and uh, when I went back to school, and she didn't. I tried to encourage her to go back to school. We kind of became isolated. Then we separated. I, that was when I had many opportunities to work out for jobs because I had my training at the University of Chicago in anthropology and sociology. And black, uh, there was a demand for more blacks in the white college and universities. But because of my children, I decided that my responsibility was to be right here in Chicago so I'd be available to them, and I was. But the GI Bill helped you uh, go to school? The GI Bill? I went to, yeah, the GI Bill made it almost impossible to not go back to school. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, uh, yes, that was the, that was what helped me in, in being married and having to, and I worked at part time at the post office in the evening. And uh, so I was busy, but uh, I went to like school. Yeah, I bill paid the most, paid the bills. Uh, I was a pretty good student, and so the university was very. St. Clair Drake was my mentor at, at the uh, the author, co-author of, of uh, Black Metropolis, and uh, he uh, was at Roosevelt as my professor, and then he encouraged me to go to the University of Chicago. I was qualified to go wherever I wanted to. 
And then uh, uh, I continued to be in touch. And we're now, as he had asked me when he was out of teaching at Stanford University in his late years, to update uh, Black Metropolis, because Black Metropolis only goes up to 19, about 1940. And a dramatic changes that come after 1940 in that same neighborhood that Black Metropolis yeah, uses. So we have some young scholars uh, now that, that are gonna pick it up, because I've waited too long to do it myself. But I'll be, I'll be looking at Adam Green, the son of, uh, of um, one of the people of the Little Rock Nine. He is at the university, he's gonna be one. Uh, Leon Dash, who is a professor down at the university, whose father and I were in World War II together. He was at the University of Illinois, and several others, but they need me to kind of help them. And they, of course, have more access to more information than I could possibly have if I was trying to do it, so I'm glad. So there's the past, and there is the present, and whether I like it or not, there's going to be a future. I want to help shape that future. You are helping to shape the future. Help to shape that future. influence a lot of young people and encourage them. Yes. Sure, to inspire oh. them. They, 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 when I have a chance to talk or when they want me, they're very, 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 very anxious to, to hear and ask questions. And I advise them, go back home or go somewhere and talk with grandma, talk with daddy, talk with people of those older generations. See what they remember from their life. And yeah, that's an when they do that, itself. yeah, when they do that, they find a lot. The similarities are, over time are much different than the divisions. Yeah. The struggle goes on. Right. And it's not always just financial. It can be physical. It can be psychological. But yeah. it goes on. But you have to keep hope. There's going to be a change when we were in combat. So we lost get people. I still believe I was going to get back home. <laughs> we had guys that committed suicide, stuff like that. Not as bad as it is now with these young people. Yeah. They are, uh, most of them that joined the army, joined to have a fairly steady income and to have a chance to go to school. They didn't join to be in combat, but there they are. And the breakdown is much, percentage-wise, much bigger yeah, than almost any time. But, you know, we still have some breakdowns from some of the combat veterans, even World War II, but not nearly comparable to these. These are much more immediate. Breakdowns and so many suicides. It's, uh, In the present. So frightening. Yeah. They didn't, and it's taken too long. Yes. I have one of my wife's, one of my wife's uh, cousins has had, I think, four returns to Afghanistan. Wow. It's bound to have some impact and then away from his family most of the time.